Okay, there we are again. Sorry, the kids woke up and wanted to watch TV, so I had to leave the couch. Um, I was talking about the gold vowel and about this graph. So here we have the percentage of the O realization across working class people, middle class people, females in general, and then old males and young males. And what you see here is that with the females, there's nothing much interesting going on. So they're at 100% O realization regardless of class. That's what you see in this column of the table here. Really, that's most of the action is in this column. It's just a few young females that use the O uh, realization, but they're not many. Um, with the males, the picture looks a lot more complicated. So there's definitely an effect of gender, but there's more than that. Also, class uh, enters the picture. And let's look at these two crossing lines here of young males and old males. Let's perhaps start with the old males. Um, if you're an old man and an old middle class man, that means that you're talking just like the women. Yeah, 90% um, O, and then a bit of something else. Um, now, if you're a working class old man, you're talking differently. Yeah. Uh, you can see that in this table, working class old men, they like to say good, yeah, rather than good, good. Um, all right. <clears throat> so for old men, there's a strong effect of class. For young men, there's also an effect of class, but change, but strangely, it goes in the different direction. Yeah. So if you're a young working class man. Um, you're sort of in between the men and the women, the old men and the women in general. Um, but if you're a middle class young man, you are actually, you sound just like an old working class guy. Yeah. So the young middle class men, they like to say good rather than gold. And this is an interesting phenomenon. Why is it that young men try to sound like old working class people? Well, um, the explanation behind that is that young middle-class males like to exaggerate the working-class pattern because they use it as a marker of local identity. Okay, It gives them a way to signal, okay, this is where we come from, this is who we are, um, uh, with an old-timey, uh, localized way of speaking. And uh, yeah, it seems that young men, young middle-class men in particular, like that. Right, um, so much for the goat vowel. I want to give you another example of um, a complex data set, a complex interaction effect, and this time we're talking about dental stopping, so realizing words like think and that as think or that. And you see we've moved to the USA. This is Louisiana. Um, and here, Milroy and Gordon give us, again, a complex table with this... Uh, yeah, <clears throat> realization of interdentals as th or t. And we have information for women and men, uh, old, middle-aged, and young, and a third variable, namely the network in which they are living, whether they are living in a closed network with just a few uh, friends that live next door, or whether they have an open network with many people yeah, from different ways of life, uh, different backgrounds. All right, when you're looking at these frequencies in the table, you're likely to understand basically nothing. So again, I've graphed these frequencies, and what we have here is the percentage of interdental stopping, how often people say tink and dat instead of think or that. Now, let's look at the people who stop the most. And not surprisingly, perhaps we have the old males here, yeah? They like to say tink and that, and also regardless of uh, network type. Closed and open, just the same, yeah? Uh, they're at about 45% tink and that. And the other line here, the purple line with the star, those are the young males. Surprise! So they exaggerate the, the way the old people talk, and that's precisely the same phenomenon, yeah? Young people using a local feature uh, to you know as a marker 
of local identity. Now, the interesting bit in this graph are the lines that go down sharply. Okay, so the green line here are old females. You see, when they're living in closed networks, they are at ratios of tink and that that are just like the old men. But if they move to a, an open network, yeah, an old female with an open network has a ratio of zero. So they say think and that and never think and that. Yeah? So a strong effect of gender if you're in an open network. <clears throat> uh, the same goes for young females also there. We see an asymmetry. Um, and the two lines at the bottom here, middle male and middle female, those two are at low rates of interdental stopping regardless of the network that they are in. And this is also a quite common effect that you see that, you know, the, the middle-aged people, the people who are out at work and see different people from different ways of life, they tend to have different speech patterns than the old people and the young people who are more influenced by, uh, you know, relatives and friends and all that. Right, uh, to sum up this uh, data examples here, um, the open-closed distinction matters chiefly for women, with open network women using much less dental stopping than closed network women, and middle males, yeah, that is the, the, the pink, no, the, the blue, dark blue line here, they have a lot less dental stopping than young males and old males. Right. So with that, I'd like to come to social categories. And uh, speaking of social categories, I have to talk about Bill Labov, the founder of modern sociolinguistics and also the author of the famous fourth floor study, which you probably know, but nonetheless, let me uh, recapitulate it briefly. So Bill Labov, he, he looked a lot younger back in 1966 when he did his fourth floor study in New York City. He wanted to know whether the use of post-vocalic R in car, or park, or floor uh, correlated with social prestige in New York City. So he did his research in three different department stores, one very cheap, one intermediate, one quite expensive, and uh, he selected some kind of thing that was found on the fourth floor, yeah? for instance, ladies' coats, or, um, I don't know, vacuum cleaners or, well, CD players weren't around in 1966. Maybe uh, vinyl records were on the fourth floor. And he approached a sales assistant asking, okay, excuse me, where are the ladies' coats expecting the answer on the fourth floor? Yeah. And what he recorded was whether somebody said fourth floor or whether somebody just said fourth floor, yeah, without the post vocalic R. What he found out was that in the cheap store, okay, few R responses in the first try at least, yeah, then he said, excuse me, where? Uh, and people went fourth floor, yeah. Uh, so those are the careful pronunciations here. Um, all right, so. Few R's in the cheap store, about 44% in the intermediate store, and the highest rate in the expensive store. Now, in the careful realizations, we have a large increase in the cheap store, also a sizable increase in the, the intermediate store, but uh, in the expensive store, people are already at ceiling, so there's not a large increase there. Bottom line is, well, post vocalic R signals social prestige in New York City. Okay, um, when I say our full pronunciation goes together with social prestige, uh, you could get the idea that the richer you are, the more R's you produce. That's true, it's almost true, yeah? <clears throat> because sometimes the effects of class are non-linear in that lower middle class speakers, you know, they don't have as much money but they try to help their case a little bit by talking a little more prestigiously than 
the middle middle class or upper middle class speakers. So Bilobov found that this was true for New York City lower middle class women. They are heavier users of post vocalic R than their upper middle class peers. Okay, um, let me finish this up by mentioning the principles of sociolinguistic change that Bill Lebov has um, posited. So there are two principles, and principle one um, has a little sub-principle there. Uh, principle one concerns men and sociolinguistic variables where there's nothing currently changing. So for a stable sociolinguistic variables, uh, men show a higher rate of non-standard forms than women. So given some kind of dialectal features, uh, given some kind of dialectal feature, you're likely to find that the men use it more than the woman than the women. Um, however, there's a little subclause to this principle, and that kicks in when when things change. So when things change, um, particularly in change that is noticed as such, women favor the incoming prestige form more than men. And you can imagine that, for instance, when you have the think and that variable, you know, once this think and that thing gets off the ground, then women lead that change. Um, also in change from below, that is in change where uh, speakers are not aware that anything is taking place, women are typically the innovators. That's really the take home point. In sociolinguistic change, it's typically adolescent women who are taking things forward, who are in the lead, who are the most progressive speakers in a speech community. Right, back to Milroy and Gordon. Um, they are a little critical of Lebovian traditional sociolinguistics, where social class is seen to take center stage. So how much money you make is sort of the central question. And other categories, such as gender, are seen as a little less important, subsidiary to class. So Milroy and Gordon argue that this is problematic. Um, and another issue that they see is that traditional sociolinguistics takes notions such as class, gender, and ethnicity for granted as simple things where you can say, okay, class, we have lower, middle, upper, gender, we have male and female, no problem, ethnicity, we have Anglo and Afro and Latino, whatever, uh, no problem. They're a little skeptical that things can be done in a way that is this straightforward. Um, in particular, what they're saying is that these social distinctions have local meanings, meanings that are not set in stone once and for all. So Miller and Gordon argue that categories, social categories such as class, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and so on and so forth, need to be studied in their local contexts, okay? So that being a woman or being gay can mean very different things depending on the local community where a sociolinguistic variable is studied. Yeah, remember that in Bill Above's principles, it's, you know, women, uh, and that's it, yeah? But being a woman or being gay or being middle class that may mean very different things depending on the community that you're in. So you can imagine being middle class in Britain or being middle class in Norway or in Switzerland or in Indonesia, those things mean different things. <clears throat> um, when we're talking about things like working class, middle class, upper class, where we're categorizing these uh, steps on the social ladder, uh, on the social ladder, that's practical for analysis, but it's also problematic because these distinctions cannot be transferred easily across cultures and communities. So that's something to keep in mind. All right, let's talk about class for a little bit. Um, class is viewed as a group of persons sharing similar occupations and incomes, similar lifestyles, and similar beliefs. <clears throat> Sociologists are really the, the, the academic people who are most concerned with class. And there are different theories of class. Yeah, So it's not like you can just say, OK, there are these 
three different categories and that's it, upper, middle, working. Um, no, there are different theories of class. And uh, there are two important theories that I would like to mention. One are, well, those are consensus-based theories of class, which would argue that classes come to be in that people with shared social backgrounds orient towards shared values. Um, and this would mean that class is sort of a continuum. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you remember what I said about communities of practice. The consensus-based view of class would say that classes are sort of communities of practice, overlapping communities of practice, people orienting towards the same way of life, the same values, the same things that we like to do. You know? Simple things we like to do. Um, consensus-based theories of class. If we, you, know, you and I, belong to the same class, we share the same ideas, we sort of have a similar outlook on life. Now, this contrasts with conflict-based theories of class, where class is really a matter of us and them. If I belong to a certain class, that means I don't belong to another class. So, in conflict-based theories of class, there are rather sharp divisions between classes. Um, and, well, I've said that consensus-based theories go along well with this idea of communities of practice. Well, also conflict-based theories have influenced sociolinguistic uh, thinking because conflict really provides the setting for language variation and change. So if I don't want to sound like somebody else, yeah, um, I can use speech as a way to signal social inclusion but also social exclusion. Um, somebody sounds in a way that is different, I uh, know that, okay, that's somebody who doesn't belong. Um, one important idea that I need to mention here is the idea of the linguistic market in that the way I talk has a value but that value can be different for different people. My family, my friends, my employer, my teachers, people that I meet when I buy some bread or a newspaper. And the value of any given speech style is assigned by something abstract that we call the linguistic market. Um, now, the linguistic market isn't just one thing. There is a macro market which uh, pertains to life in public and there's a micro market which is more local. Yeah, so the micro market concerns family or my social network of friends, whereas the macro market also concerns people that I meet in official settings. <clears throat> and now it turns out that speakers can have different orientations to the macro market or the micro market. That is, they, they can assign more or less importance to macro markets and micro markets. <clears throat> For instance, I can be very, very much concerned about my local network of friends and it's important to me that I talk exactly like they do. Or I can have more of a macro market orientation, say, okay, I want to get ahead in life, I want to you know, please the people who are my teachers at school or university and um, my superiors who come from different places in the country. So that means I have a sort of macro market orientation. I care more about the grand scheme of things than how things are in my little village. Um, so depending on their orientation to different markets, speakers adapt their speech in order to increase its value to their interlocutors. Do I use a variant that is valuable to someone with a macro market outlook or do I adapt my speech to micro market people? That is a kind of unconscious choice that uh, people are making. <clears throat> now, class-related sociolinguistic variation is typically less a matter of how much money you make, your socioeconomic status, than really a matter of your orientation to the market. It's not about where you are economically, it's about where you want to be economically. Yeah? So middle-class speech is performed by speakers with a positive attitude towards middle-class values, such as, you know, it's good to have higher education, it's good to live in a suburb and drive a huge 
SUV. It's good to you know um, travel around the country and know people from all corners of the world. Working class speech, on the other hand, is performed by speakers who want to signal alliances towards local networks and practices. Yeah. <clears throat> so if you care about the local network of people that you have, you're more likely to adopt a working class. You know, you're more likely to use the kind of speech that you heard the old working class people use than something more supra-regional that is found all over the country and probably closer to a standard um, variant. Socioeconomic status and the job that you do, your professional occupation, that sort of stands emblematically for these ways of speech, uh, but they're not the cause of linguistic behavior. They're more of a corollary, something that happens um, you know, also. It's not the cause, it's just something that accompanies these ways of speaking. All right, a few things about gender. Um, I don't need to tell you that, all right, there's this biological way of viewing sex as a categorical variable, either or, yeah, whether your organs are designed for sperm production or for reproduction. Um, well, and then there's gender, which is more something along a continuum. You can decide to be, you know, present yourself as ultra masculine or ultra feminine or anything in between, basically. Um, Right. Um, so, <clears throat> I said earlier that early sociolinguistic work viewed gender variation really as subsidiary to social class, with women orienting towards some kind of prestige norm that was you know, associated with a given socioeconomic status. Um, there are some problems associated with this. For instance, you could ask yourself, why is it that women should care more uh, about prestige norms than men. Are men not as enamored with high socioeconomic status? Well, they probably are. Uh, so why is it that it just shows up linguistically more in women? Um, also, what forms, what linguistic variants carry prestige and what do they stand for? Another question. Um, we also saw that there are really different sources of prestige. There's the covert prestige of traditional local forms of speaking, yeah, things of, uh, for instance, upper class southern U.S. English, that is, you know, prestigious within a certain local community. It's not so prestigious outside that community. And there's also the prestige of supra-local standard forms. <clears throat> okay, so which is the prestige that you orient towards if you're a woman in the southern US? Do you uh, choose the, the local upper-class speech or do you choose the perhaps less upper-class but more widely known standard US speech? That's something that you can uh, ask yourself. Right, um, so not all changes that are led by female speakers, I mentioned that when uh, language changes, uh, it's typically female speakers that are in the lead. Not all of these involve an orientation towards the speech of higher social classes. So for instance, um, so in, in British English there's a spreading replacement of T's with glottal stops and that is driven by young female speakers. So things like ba -a, yeah, uh, butter, ba -a. And glottal stops are traditionally a feature of male working class speech but apparently females have picked up this feature, made it their own, and are now spreading it. And the interesting bit about this is that, well, once young females start using it, it's not a way of signaling working class, old-timey identity, but rather what female speakers do with it is that they bring about a social re-evaluation of these features. So once young females start using it, it is actually prestigious. It is actually something nice. So females do not favor prestige variants. Rather, you could say that they create them. Yeah. When I wear this, it looks cool. Yeah. Um, 
that's an interesting thing about gender and language change. All right, I already talked about that. I already talked about that. Um, so let's talk about ethnicity. Um, ethnic forms are formed by persons who share or believe that they share common cultural characteristics. So a sense of place where you know, my people is usually have, have spent their time, common history, common destiny, sometimes a shared religion, a social ideology, a shared language, uh, or a set of communicative conventions. All of that, and not necessarily all of that. Um, now, ethnic distinctions are rarely neutral with regard to power. So typically, ethnicities are unequal with regard to wealth and power. And uh, if you label something as an ethnic group, it typically is a minority group. So the majority is not an ethnicity. The majority that we tend to think in terms of, well, those are the normal people, yeah? And the ethnic groups are those that are in some way not normal, the minority groups whose members are discriminated against by the majority population. Well, um, <clears throat> Milroy and Gordon are careful to point out that ethnicity is really a social construct. It's not something that is out there, that is objectively there, but it's rather something that is constructed, much like gender and other social categories. So physical differences, which are held up as, okay, this is how you recognize somebody with this ethnicity, are really selectively chosen as ethnically significant. So skin color, prime example, um, that's a category, well, that, that, that's a characteristic that you can use to um, construct ethnicity. Other social, uh, no, uh, other physical features are seemingly not as important. Hair color, eye color, well, there we are, really liberal. You can have any eye color you want. doesn't make you a different ethnicity. Um, spatial segregation and absence of social mobility. When people live in areas that are only inhabited by same ethnicity people, an absence of social mobility, when you're not moving through different professions, but rather you do the same profession that your father and grandfather has had, that favors the emergence of groups that are seen as different ethnicities. And social class, in a way, is a tool to preserve ethnic differences. Um, OK, um, speaking about ethnicity, I have to say a few words about Af African American vernacular English in the US. Um, the interesting thing about Av is that, well, it's a dialect, it's a variety. But it's not a regional variety. It's found all over the United States. You could call it a supra-local variant of English, uh, which has local differences. Yeah, people, uh, AV speakers in Philadelphia talk a bit different from uh, AV speakers in Los Angeles or in Florida. <clears throat> but besides these local differences, there are actually a number of supra-local characteristics of AV that the varieties of AV that we have have in common. Um, AV speakers are set apart in a number of ways from speakers of uh, US standard English, you could call it, um, in that, for instance, AV speakers don't participate in ongoing sound changes like the northern cities shift, uh, the northern city shift here shown, uh, well, the second map, you have Detroit, Cleveland, Buffalo, um, and Toronto. So some Canadian cities actually participate in the northern cities shift, <clears throat> uh, where people say God when they really say God. So as speakers don't, um, don't participate in that. Right, I'm coming to a summary here. Um, let you go. I talked about sociolinguistic variables, so the variance that linguistic structures have, ways of saying the same thing in different ways. I've talked about factors that explain uh, the choices that speakers make there, language internal factors, language external factors. I talked about main effects of gender, age, class. 
Um, I also talked about interaction effects, where a factor has an effect, but only if a second factor also comes in. And I talked about confounds, where somebody something appears to have an effect, but it's actually uh, a different variable that carries the effect that is masked. I talked about Lebois principles, men usually producing more standard form, non-standard forms in, in stable variation, and women being in the lead in, in changes. So they favor incoming prestige forms and they are the linguistic innovators. I also mentioned a few points where Miller and Gordon critique traditional sociolinguistic assumptions, so in particular the idea that you can't just assume that there are things like ethnicity or socioeconomic status or gender. These things mean different things depending on where you are. Okay, so with class, gender, and ethnicity, question ready-made distinctions, interpret distinctions in their local contexts, and consider interactions of these factors that influence linguistic variation. Okay, um, I'm coming to an end here, and I would like to give you a little uh, exercise. So work with a neighbor and um, <clears throat> consider your own ways of speaking. So tell your neighbor about a sociolinguistic variable that characterizes your own speech. Um, determine is this variable a matter of sound, is it a matter of morphology, or is it a matter of syntax? Um, define the possible realizations of that variable and indicate which one you typically produce or which one you think you typically produce. And then make a list of the factors that might lead you to realize that variable in different ways. When you're saying this, when are you saying the other thing? Which of these factors do you think are particularly strong? And also think a little how you could test your intuitions. And uh, I would like you to you know, address these six questions and then summarize the discussion that you have had with your neighbor to tell everybody else about sociolinguistic variation in your neighbor's speech. All right? Okay. Um, at this point, I say bye-bye and uh, have a good exercise. And I'll, Martina will tell me everything about the discussions that you've had. All right. That's it.